Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister, how are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing really well. How are you? Alhamdulillah, fine. Very good, thank you. Jazakallah khair for joining us today on the Niqabi Diaries. Sister, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Um, yeah, sure. Um, my name is Sally Hasdan and I run Bloom Adventures, which is like an outdoor adventure organization where we uh, seek to use the serenity of nature to reconnect sisters with themselves, with each other, and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their creator. MashaAllah, that sounds very interesting. So, yeah. um, mashallah, how long have you been wearing the niqab then, sister? Um, it's been more than 16 years now. I put it on when I was 17, and I'm going to be 34 this summer, inshallah. Mashallah, tabarakallah. So, um, what made you want to wear the niqab, and how did you get to come about wearing it? Um, so, <laughs> I was raised in this really, really, really small town in Florida, and um, it was back in the 90s, and in my little town, it was like, you either wore hijab with like abaya, and it was all like really plain and really, really simple, and it's like you wore it for like, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of modesty, or you didn't wear anything at all. And so, I was like brought up in a family where, you know, my father was Muslim, but not really practicing, and my mom was um, Catholic. And so, we kind of were exposed to both, you know, Catholicism, and we were both exposed to Islam, and it was kind of like, we had to stop and make a decision for ourselves. And, you know, it, I didn't really know, you know, where I felt the most comfortable and I didn't really know where I fit in. And, and I just felt like a sense of peace when I was around all the Muslim sisters. And I was always that one non-hijabi girl with all the hijabi girls. Okay. And um, eventually I, um, alhamdulillah, like Allah, Allah opened my heart and I started practicing when I was 16 and I put on hijab and abaya. And then, um, alhamdulillah. yeah, alhamdulillah. And it was about a year later um that my sister introduced me to niqab and she was telling me about how you know all of the sahabiyat they all wore niqab the prophet's wives all wore niqab and she was talking about how like this is like um this is like a really really awesome thing that we can do and so i started to learn more about niqab because before that i had only been exposed to niqab as like something that like in my head i thought it was just something that you know like it was a cultural thing like saudi women did it or something like that and so as soon as my sister was like no no no, this is from the dean i was like wow i didn't know that so i started doing my research and I just absolutely fell in love with the idea of niqab. I thought it was fascinating and it really, really fit what I had been raised in as a younger child in my little small town in Florida because it was just, it was, it was for me the pinnacle of modesty and it was what hijab represented to me. And it just, it just ticked all the boxes. And I said, you know, let me, let me go ahead and try this and see how I feel. And, and I put it on and it was like everything clicked and it, it just made sense. And it's just, alhamdulillah, it's just been smooth sailing since then. Alhamdulillah, mashallah, sounds amazing. Wow, so you've been wearing it since then for 17 years. Yeah, there was a little bit of struggle at the beginning with my father because he wasn't a fan of it. But alhamdulillah, 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 it all worked out in the end. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. So apart from the struggles that you had with your father, would you say that it was easy for you to wear and why or why not? The niqab itself was easy for me to wear. Of course, when you do something new, like when I first put on hijab too, like you get like slight like headaches and stuff like that because you're tying something to your head that you're not normally tying, you know? So that happened to me with hijab first too. So, you know, there was just like a period where you get used to it. You figure out how to tie it. You figure out how to get, you know, comfortable um, just like living your day-to-day -day life in it. But like in terms of like my heart, there was never any, it just, it just fit into what I had always understood to be modesty and it made me feel that much closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it was something that came to me naturally so I haven't really ever struggled with it alhamdulillah alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. so where as, as in um when we talk about um you know actually wearing the niqab the actual physical aspect of it where did you get the niqab from was it easy for you to access you know getting them buying them from shops how did you get hold of the niqabs to wear um, yeah, yeah, no, it, it was easy for me to get them. Like I said, my sister was the one who introduced me to niqab. So, um, like, I, I knew how to get them. I knew how to, like, access them. There wasn't really any issues with that. Currently, I am still on a search <laughs> for the perfect niqab, and I haven't found it yet. And I keep on telling myself I'm going to, you know, figure out a situation where I can figure out the perfect niqab. But, um, but in terms of that, finding them in shops and everything like that, there was no, there was no struggle for me. Alhamdulillah. So are you getting them like, do, there, are there shops there, like Islamic shops or anything? So right now I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, right. in, 
in the States. And Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Minneapolis, Minnesota is home to a huge population of Somali diaspora. And we have a whole Somali mall. Actually, we have two now. And it's just floors and floors and floors of hijabs and abayas and clothing and gloves and everything you could possibly need. So Alhamdulillah, there's no struggle. And Alhamdulillah, we have the internet too. And there's a lot of great websites that sell things. And I have family members that, that bring me nice clothes from overseas when they come and visit. So Alhamdulillah. Did, did you say it's a Somali community? Yeah, in, in, in the Twin Cities alone where I live, we have 150,000 um, Somali people in our community. Alhamdulillah. 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 It's great. So did you have any obstacles from anybody else in your family for you? You mentioned that your mother is, um, well, she was a Catholic. So how did she find your transition into wearing the hijab and then wearing the niqab? Right. So my mom started practicing Islam when I was, or she, she, she reverted to Islam, alhamdulillah, when I was 15. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, yeah, alhamdulillah. And once, and she, you know, my mother is, is this really, 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 really sweet Polish woman. And as soon as she reverted to Islam, she very much turned to me and my older sister to teach her all the rules. And I feel like a lot of times with mothers, um, with mothers who are, you know, born Muslim and they're raising their daughters, they always say to the daughters, you can wear this, you can't wear this, you can do this, you can't do that. But with my mom, as soon as she became Muslim, the roles kind of flipped and she would then come to me and my sister and say, can I do this? Can I do that? Is this okay? Is that okay? So when we put on the niqab, she was just kind of like, oh, is this the right thing to do? Oh, how do you breathe? Oh, how this? Oh, how that? And she was just very, very curious about it. But she was very, very um, open. My mom, alhamdulillah, Allah has like protected her heart. Even when she was Catholic, she was the one that would, you know, she would drive us out 45 minutes to go to the one masjid in our little town in Florida. And, like, oh, mashallah, that's so sweet. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And that's what ended up le leading her. She would just go and sit in the corner and it was this... um. Palestinian mustard in Palm Beach, Florida, and we had to drive like 45 minutes out there. And she would do it every single Sunday because she said to my father, the girls can be any religion you want them to be, but they have to know what their religion is and they have to believe in God. So, she, yeah. so my dad was like, okay, find something. She found the place. She would drive us out every week and she would sit alone. And alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, some of the sisters would go and talk to her and they gave her a copy of the Quran. And, you know, once she read the Quran, you know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So my mom has always been an extremely supportive person. She's always been extremely, Allah has protected her heart. Alhamdulillah, may Allah continue to protect her in her heart. Alhamdulillah, I mean, I mean, oh, how sweet, mashallah. That's, so, that's such a lovely story. Oh, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. With, with my father, with my father, my father is Egyptian and he was raised, you know, with Egyptian culture. Hmm. And there's a lot of opinions about niqab. Yeah. And unfortunately, there are some opinions about um, like a certain class of people wearing niqab and there's very much the Egyptian society is very much like a classist society unfortunately and my father didn't really understand the religious implications behind niqab and he wasn't he wasn't a fan of it and he was worried about and of course you know some kind of parents they always act out of love and out of care for you and it was out of his love for me that he was it was something that he was unfamiliar with and he was just worried mm -hmm. about my well-being and so he really wanted to make sure that I wanted to wear it for the right reasons and so he really argue the fact that I wanted to wear it and then alhamdulillah once he realized that I was very um determined <laughs> you know I was I was 17 and when you're young you're a teenager and you rebel against your parents unfortunately yeah. and you know I just I was very at the time when I first put on niqab, when I first decided to put on niqab, I thought that it was like so I don't know <laughs> could you just repeat that again you said that when you first started to wear it, you thought it was sunnah yeah, when I decided I wanted to put on niqab, I thought it was sunnah. Right. And then my father, he wasn't, he wasn't for it. And he was like, you know, you really shouldn't do this. And, you know, all of these things. And how are you going to get married? And how is this going to happen? And how are you, gonna, you know, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there weren't issues. But I wanted to explain to him why I was truly motivated to wear niqab. So I ended up doing a ton of research. And I, like, looked up all of the hadith. And I read all of the you know, things. And I read all of the different fatawa. And in, in doing all of that research, I actually changed my opinion to believe that niqab was actually fart. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, yeah, when I, when I decided that, that I personally followed the opinion that it was sparked, then it became, well, even if my father tells me I can wear it. Yeah, you still have to do it, yeah. You still have to do it. And so I wanted to find a compromise between, you know, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, keeping the respect of my father, um, you know, uh, keeping the respect of my father because, you know, you have to treat your parents with respect. And so in the end, what I did was, alhamdulillah, I had graduated um, high school a year early and 
it was the summer before I went away to college or I you know, decided to go to college. And so I was at home and I had just graduated and it was like a week after I graduated and I told my dad I wanted to wear a job and he wasn't for it. And so I said to him, you know, I explained to him all the rulings and everything and there was a back and forth, you know, conversation between us. And then I said to him, you know, Baba, I love you and I want to respect you and I don't want to upset you by wearing a job. But I also don't want to disrespect Allah by going outside without my niqab. So I stayed home the whole summer. Right. And when we had guests come over, I would like go hide in my room. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, yeah. And so my dad, when he realized that I was very, very, very serious about wearing niqab mm-hmm. and that I was determined to not leave the house. And he was worried because, you know, my father, alhamdulillah, he, he, he's so caring and loving. He really wanted to make sure that, that we were like, um, you know, we really like achieved high levels of like academic success and all of that. Yeah. As that she's not going to go to college, even though she got into this great school, <laughs> he was like, okay, yeah. listen, you can wear the niqab, you can do whatever you want. Just go to school and get good grades. And I was like, of course, Baba, I love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh. yeah, just right before school started, I was, I was able to wear niqab outside and, you know, live my life. And alhamdulillah, you know, Allah makes the way. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Wow. So do you think that, um, when, do you find there's any difference from you wearing hijab and when you when you start since you've been wearing the niqab like in the treatment that you've received from Muslims or even non-Muslims? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a big difference. Um, when I wore hijab, it's like you stand out a little bit, um, but you kind of blend in with all of the other hijabis, you mm-hmm. know. And when you wear niqab, it's like your face isn't there, and so naturally you know, when people see you, they do a double take. And, you know, I live, you know, I live in the States and there aren't a lot of niqabis and there aren't even a lot of hijabis, but alhamdulillah, I live in an area that's heavily Muslim, alhamdulillah. So people are used to seeing people that look different. And Minneapolis itself is just a very diverse, alhamdulillah, city. So people are used to seeing, you know, people who look other than. And so, but it's like when there isn't a face there, I think it's natural for people to look and say, oh, well, that looks strange or that looks different. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And and personally, I don't take any offense whatsoever when people look at me because, you know, when I see a group of nuns walk by, I kind of pause and look at them just because I'm fascinated because, you know, they must live such a different lifestyle than me. And that's so interesting. And I wonder what their day-to-day looks like. And it's just a curiosity. So for me, when people look at me, I just take it as, oh, well, they're curious. And if they have bad intentions, that's between them and God, you know? <laughs> but um, as long as they're just looking curiously, like, I don't, I don't mind that in any way, shape, or form. I lived in Egypt for, for quite a while. And when I lived in Egypt and people, I got the most commentary and the most negative comments and the most, it was the most difficult for me to wear niqab in Egypt. Really? Was, yes. <laughs> Which part of Egypt was you living? So I lived in, um, I lived right outside of Cairo okay. for a long time. And then I lived in Alexandria, Egypt. And in Alexandria, it was slightly easier, but I lived in Egypt, um, I don't know, but during both of the revolutions, and when there was the revolutions, there was a lot of anger towards people that were outwardly looking like they practice Islam. Yeah. And so I would get a lot of commentary. I would be called a lot of names. A couple of times I feared for my, like, safety because people would, like, circle around me and shout things at me. And I would, like, run to my, like, apartment building. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And in the States, you know, I've never had issues like that. Alhamdulillah has protected me. Every once in a while you get, like, a rude comment. Um, but I've never feared for my safety. Mm-hmm. I've never felt, you know, targeted as a niqabi, but in Egypt, it was constant. And, and a lot of my friends who were niqabis, um, they, they, they left the country, actually, after the second revolution, because it just got... Oh, really wow. So w- which year was that, roughly? Oh, I have to look it up. It was about six years ago, so I want to okay. say, yeah, like 2013, 2014. Yeah, subhanAllah. So, like, when you was living in Egypt at that time and facing this kind of, you know, kind of harassment and things, was your father there, and how did he feel about that? Yeah, he was there and he wasn't a fan of it, but also um, at that time, you know, at that time he had gotten used to it because at that time I had been wearing niqab for like 10 plus years, you know what I mean? So he wasn't really, he knew I knew how to handle myself and he, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, my father was only worried at the beginning, you know? And then, you know, after he realized, you know, they're dedicated, you know, she's doing this for the right reasons, she's good, you know, he, he alhamdulillah, you know, fatherly love, alhamdulillah, he was totally fine with it, he, was, he still is fine with it. It was just at the very beginning, it was something new and different, and it was like, is this really what you want to do? Do you realize this is going to be difficult, you know? And he was just watching out for me in his own way, you know? Alhamdulillah, yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah, I understand that part, but I'm just thinking, like, from the aspect of obviously him being a father, and especially you being in his home country, you know, and then having this kind of experience, like, you know, what kind of, I don't know, 
like what was his reaction you know because obviously you've been living in america and wearing it for a while and not having as much difficulty as when you've been living in the actual muslim country yeah i mean for him he knew that like i mean america you know i, I was born and raised here it's my home and you know it's where i plan to live forever and egypt is just like a temporary thing yeah it was temporary thing. and so you know it it just it was, and honestly, I think that if I probably went back to Egypt now to visit or something, I bet it would be completely different now. Yes, it was, wow. the, you know, the revolutions, it, it was a rough time in the country, you know? Mm -hmm. So may Allah make it easy for all of the, you know, there's so much mm -hmm. turmoil, there's so many things going on in the world, and, you know, you don't really realize what's really going on unless you're actually there, you know? Yes, but alhamdulillah, Allah. I'm sure that it's better now, I'm sure that things are different now, but at the time, and alhamdulillah, that was, it was, I actually really appreciate that, because... Now, when I'm out and like I go to the store, I go wherever, and everyone's like looking at me, I'm just like, Alhamdulillah, these people are not Muslim. These people don't know what this is. These yeah, exactly. Look at me. Whereas when you're in a Muslim country and everyone's looking at you, you're kind of like, well, don't you guys know what this is? Don't you, yeah. know? Don't you, know? Don't you know the situation? And you know, my opinions about the rulings have changed and have switched, and I've, I've, I've given up trying to, um, you know, have opinions about what opinions are. But at the end of the day, I just feel like, this is something that brings me very, very, very close to Allah. And, and Allah has given us so many ways to get closer to Allah. And for me, this is like a way that I can get close to Allah. Yeah, and I just, I love it with my whole heart. And I feel like Nikhab has really protected me from so many bad situations. And I love that about it. You know, like I really feel like it, it, it's a tool, you know what I mean? And it really, really helps me in my everyday life. You know, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. I think, um, you know, it's just interesting you sharing that with us because I found here, you know, sometimes people might make comments like, oh, you know, why don't you go back to your own country or go and live in a Muslim country? You know, why are you wearing it in the West, for example? And people don't seem to realize in some Muslim countries, people don't like the niqab for various reasons, you know, and they think that it's just something you should do when you're living in a Muslim country. And they don't attach the, the niqab is actually just something from Islam. You know, I found that even with some sisters that I've met, even from, for example, Saudi Arabia, they wear niqab when they're there, but then when they come to the Western countries, they stop wearing it. So they attach it more to the culture rather than to the religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that it's different for everybody, you know, and people's reasoning behind doing different things, you know, that's between them and Allah. And, you know, Allah, you know, that's between them and Allah. But for me personally, I just... I just, I just have found that, you know, wearing it in the States has just been so much easier for me. I found it to be, I mean, and the thing with me personally is I'm, I'm a sister who's 5'11", and I don't know what that is in meters, but it's wow. extremely tall. I'm taller than most of the, Not like when I stand at the mess, I can see over everyone's head. Okay. And so from a very young age, everyone would always look at me. Mm. So I'm used to being looked at. I'm used to being stared at. <laughs> so for me, now wearing niqab, and you know, I do feel like it does make wearing niqab a little bit harder because I've noticed, alhamdulillah, Allah's blessed me with friends who also wear niqab. And when we're, you know, when they're out, they can kind of blend into the crowd. But because I'm tall, my head sticks out. <laughs> yeah. So you can always see my head sticking out. And then you can always see the fact that you can't see my face. And so I kind of stand out. And sometimes I feel like I might look slightly like, intimidating whereas a smaller niqabi she could look like really cute you know <laughs> so, <laughs> but the, the positive of that though the positive side of that is that i always feel really safe because if i want to look intimidating <laughs> i'm a tall girl yeah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. You know? alhamdulillah. I, I never worry about alhamdulillah i'm a tall girl who likes the outdoors who has taken lots of self-defense lessons and i'm really into you know physical activity and stuff like that so alhamdulillah, i'm not i never i'm never you know like um I'm never scared more than I need to be. You know, I feel very, very comfortable between tawakkul and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in between, you know, um, having, you know, my height and my, you know, physical abilities and stuff. You know what I mean? So alhamdulillah, for everything that's slightly difficult, there's also a lot of ease that comes with it, you know? Alhamdulillah. So would you say that you think that the niqab is a barrier? I have only found the niqab to be a barrier in places where a barrier should be. And sometimes that has been such a, a, a blessing for me because I didn't even realize that I needed there to be a barrier there. Like, for example, when I first started working and I was trying to find a job and, you know, certain places, you know, you, you know, I, I sound like a valley girl because I was raised in Southern Florida, you know, and mm -hmm. I talk to people on the phone and I say, my name is Sally Hassan and da, 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 and I show up for an interview and then they look at me and they're like, this is not what I expected to see. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so... 
what I found is when, when niqab was a barrier for me in those situations, what I discovered is that it turns out that those places wouldn't have had a great work environment for me anyways. Yeah. And the places that I went to where they were more open-minded and they were like, you know, they were willing, they were happy to accept, you know, somebody who looked different, somebody who had, you know, their own standards and their own uh, boundaries that they had set for themselves. They actually met that with respect instead. And then the work environment itself was actually something that was, um, going to make me comfortable. So, you know, I could look at it and say, well, I wasn't, I had a hard time finding a job because I wore niqab. Or I could say, you know, subhanAllah, because of my niqab, I was able to find a work environment for me that worked out perfectly for me. And Allah protected me from all of these situations that I wouldn't have realized I would have had to deal with, you know? Yeah, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. That's a really good mindset and a really good way of seeing it, actually. Because I think what happens a lot of the time with sisters, when they want to do certain things, even to wear the hijab, for example, I mean, at least from my experience here, sometimes sisters they 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 um they don't want to wear the niqab or they or they don't want don't want to, they're apprehensive of even wearing the hijab, for example, because they feel that it's going to stop them from getting a good job. But you know, if you think about it the way that you're you know you've expressed that you'll get what is right for you, you know, when you go around doing the things that you actually want. Do you know what I mean? You're not compromising your beliefs. You're going for what you want to please Allah. And then you get the job that's actually going to fit you in your situation rather than looking for something and compromising your beliefs and then maybe not being that happy in the end. Mm -hmm. And I truly, truly believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is ar razaq right? Yeah. He has already written for us exactly what we're going to receive in this dunya in terms of all, you know, aspects of our life, but, you know, especially in terms of finances. And I don't, I, I, have, a, I have a hard time when, when, you know, when people say, well, I can't get this job and, you know, it's because I'm wearing niqab. I don't believe that personally because I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I'm doing something that's going to bring me closer to Allah, something that he loves, which is wearing niqab, right? This mm -hmm. is my way to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. So he's not going to prevent me from receiving risk that has already been written for me. If anything, yeah, he's going to make it easier for me because I've turned to him and I've placed my tawakkul in him. And I found, alhamdulillah, that, that niqab has not been a barrier in my work in any way, shape, or form. And if anything, it encouraged me, you know, it encouraged me to, you know, at first I worked in corporate America. I had all these different jobs. I worked in actually many different areas, um, trying to find the thing that really suited me best. And then in the end, I ended up, you know, founding Bloom Adventures because, it was because of Niqab, you know, I wanted a safe space for sisters to all connect in a space where it was only sisters, where we could, you know, have that childhood nostalgia, be able to go and swim in the lake, be able to go and ride the bicycles, be able to connect with nature, be able to connect with each other in a space that's completely private and halal for us to do that. Oh, and one, yeah, and one of my favorite things about our retreats is that when we get there, it's sisters only, it's women only. We even bring out our own, you know, chef to cook us this beautiful halal food and everything. It's all women. So as soon as we get there, we take off our hijabs, we take off our niqabs, we take off, you know, and we just wear our clothes and we are all just together with one another. You know what I mean? So there are no barriers there. There's nothing there. And we can truly just connect with another, connect with another in a natural setting. And I never would have probably founded this organization if I wasn't, you know, wearing niqab and finding you know, that I wasn't feeling comfortable, you know, going and, you know, doing all of this, like, because, you know, when you do a lot of physical activity and you're trying to breathe and all of these things, and sometimes it can be difficult. So, alhamdulillah, I feel like niqab, if anything, has helped me embrace who I am more so than anything else, you know? SubhanAllah, because so, I suppose that we do have challenges as niqabis that other sisters might not experience. So that you've, you've made sure you found a way in order for us to do those other things that definitely we enjoy and in, 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 enjoy nature, for example. SubhanAllah, so can you just tell us more about this um, Bloom Adventures? Obviously, you've mentioned about, you know, what made you get it going. But just like, for example, say that I want to go to Bloom Adventures. How would you tell me about it? Right. So um, every summer we do several retreats. Our most popular retreat is one that we do over Labor Day weekend, which is like right at the beginning of September. It's like a goodbye to the summer. And what we do is um, in the States, we have these things called, it's called Girl Scouts of America. And it's like um, they have these campsites. And so what we'll do is we'll rent out the whole campsite from them. And it's so the whole campsite is just us and our staff. And all of the sisters come in and we have a whole weekend scheduled for everybody, but also you can choose to, to you know, attend our communal things or you can just go off on your own. 
my sister, she's very introverted and she comes to the retreats, you know, to support me and for herself and everything. And she just brings her whole bag full of books. And then she just sits by the lake and reads her books. <laughs> but what we do is we all gather together and um, there's these beautiful like lakeside retreat center. And we sleep there and we hang out there and we do like communal prayers and we all eat together and we play games together. Um, we do some talks together. Um, we have campfires in the evenings and we sit around the campfire and we have like discussions. Um, after the prayers, we have kwataras, we do physical activity, we go hiking, we, we teach canoeing and swimming and everything in the lake. Cause obviously it's only sisters, so we can, you know, do that. And it's just, it's just a weekend where we can just take a break, you know, because our bodies, they have a right upon us, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask us, did you give your body the right that it deserved? You know, were you physical? Were you active? Were you keeping yourself healthy? You know, did you, you know, give your body what it deserves? And so I think it's important, especially Muslim women, we carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. And a lot of times we forget that we have to take care of ourselves, right? We can't pour from an empty cup. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah. So, so Alhamdulillah, we have these retreats where people can just come and they can just take a break and they can just relax and they can connect with each other. And it tends to be, um, and some of our camps are more like spirituality focused than other ones. Like our first camp this summer, it's the weekend before Ramadan. And we brought on um, one of my close friends, Ustada Kaltun Parani, and she's, she's a great friend of mine and she's going to be, um, she's going to be, it's going to be more of like a spirituality retreat. So we're going to do like the hajjud at night and we're going to do like all of, um, there's going to be like a lot of lessons throughout the day and it's going to be more structured. Do you know what I mean? But some of the retreats, they're more relaxation, self-care based. And some of the retreats are more um, like Dean based. And some of the retreats are like, we're going to go out in tents and we're going to sleep in tents and we're going to teach you how to cut down a tree and how to light a fire and how to like cook off the no nature. Yeah. So we have something for, and we even have one camp that's for preteen girls. Um, and we call it Camp Monarch because they're changing at that age. You know, they're, they're about to go through puberty. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So we take out the young girls and it's just, I think it's really an important time for them to really have other Muslim girls that are going through the exact same that they're going, the same thing that they're going through, the same struggles. And we bring out a bunch of younger girls that are a little bit older than them, but they're good role models in the community. And we just let them connect for a weekend and we talk to them about these things. And we do these like Iman building activities and whatnot. And we just show them that, you know, you can be a Muslim girl, you can wear a hijab and you can, you know, have a break where you can, cause you know, I feel like all Spanish are created in our nature as women that, you know, there are times like when you get dressed up and you, you know, you put on makeup and this and that, you feel good, you know, and Allah created us that way. And he's also given us like a halal way to, you know, funnel and channel that energy, right? So it may be in our house with our husband and that's pleasing to our husband, or it could be, you know, with our friends at these like, you know, community events or whatever it is. But the, I feel like these things have to be, we have to have a halal venue for us to do these things because otherwise we're going to have these like desires inside of us like you know you want to feel pretty you know but i feel like there's like a halal way to express that feeling in a halal situation so bloom is all about creating halal situations so that sisters can embrace who they are you know and they won't feel like they're missing out on anything do you know what i mean yeah alhamdulillah mashallah sounds amazing really Allah, really, I want to come to the camps. <laughs> <laughs> you are always welcome to come, inshallah. <laughs> Mashallah, you're in Britain. You guys have the best stuff going on there. Us in the States, we're just like running after you guys trying to catch up. Mashallah. Yes, oh, well. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm obviously in the wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. So have, speaking of, um, you know, camping and being outside and things like that, traveling and these kind of things, have you done any kind of traveling? Like, was you, you've been to Egypt and stuff. Would you, did you wear your niqab while you were traveling as, traveling as well? And how did you find that? Um, yeah, I've actually, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, my, my father worked in hospitality before he retired. So we traveled actually a lot of the world, alhamdulillah. Um, and so I've been all over the place, alhamdulillah, in different countries, Muslim and non-Muslim countries. And um, I haven't found niqab to be in in any way, shape, or form. Sorry, can I you just say that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, from, which, from which part? <laughs> you just said you haven't had any something in any shape or form, because I just had a notification which just like cut off completely what you're saying. No, no, totally fine, yeah. I said that I haven't found niqab to be a hindrance um, in when I've been traveling at all. Yeah, um, I've noticed that there are certain places where it can be more shocking. Like, um, like my mother is Polish, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in Poland, you know, Eastern Europe, there, there, there's a lot of Islamophobia in Eastern Europe. And yeah. like me personally, like when I was little, Alhamdulillah, um, every two summers we would spend the whole summer in Poland. And it was such a beautiful, wonderful, you know, upbringing, Alhamdulillah, in the mountains and the orchards and the farms and everything like that. But you know, as an adult now, I would never choose to go live there or go there for an extended period of time because, you know, 
there is a lot of Islamophobia and they're not used to seeing hijabis and niqabis. It's, yeah. it, it's, a, it's, a rough, it's not an easy situation. And any, you know, Muslim sisters that live there, I feel for them and Mila make it easy for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but like when I go places like, like I, you know, alhamdulillah, we're free to make our own, you know, decisions. And so when we travel now, we do try to like, like when it, when it was up to me to choose, like, I was like, let's go to Malaysia where it's all Muslims, you know, mm-hmm. and let's go, you know, alhamdulillah. And there, there is a lot of opportunity for, um, for, for like Muslim tourism, you know, to go to places like Malaysia. And like lately I have, I've mostly been traveling around the States. Um, and like, I just travel, I usually just go for like conferences and classes and, and you know, Islamic events and things like that, you know? Um, and just traveling through the airport, I feel like, I feel like people are kind of more, um, people stare at you more, mm-hmm. but I never travel alone. I don't believe that that's right. And I'm always traveling in a, in a very, very, very large group of people. And so there's always at least, you know, five to 10 other hijabis, another niqabi, another whatever. Yeah. And so we're traveling in this huge pack. So even if people look, it might just be, wow, look at all those people. And, you know, and I haven't heard many times. And usually people in the airport are very, um, like airport workers, they're very understanding, they're very accommodating. And it's just a matter of, of if you're, I feel like people will treat you the way that you demand to be re- treated. Yeah. So if you are a person who like respects yourself, then people will treat you with respect. And I feel like a lot of times we're just, we're scared to do what we feel comfortable with because we're scared to make other people uncomfortable. But I think the reason that people are uncomfortable is because they don't know what to do. So I feel like if we just tell people, hey, this is what I need, they're like, oh, sure, let me help you, you know? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, subhanAllah. True. So, mashallah, sister, have you, in your, all your travels, and, you know, I'm sure you've met Naqabis from all over the world, have you met anybody who's been forced to wear the Naqab or... Have you met anybody who wants to wear it but has not been allowed to wear it for any particular reason? Yeah, I don't know anyone who has been forced. That's not something I've come across um, ever. Um, I have heard of pressure from parents to wear hijab, but I've never heard of it for niqab. And I'm sure that it exists, but I personally have never come across it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in terms of somebody wanting to, I know a lot of people, especially in Egypt, I had a lot of friends who, who desperately wanted to wear niqab, but their, their husbands didn't want them to. Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah, and, um, and, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, we tend to end up, you know, Allah, Allah connects like-minded souls, you know? And so I had a lot of friends that were from different places, and they were, you know, expats living in Egypt, and a lot of them were people who had reverted. And so a lot of them, you know, they married their spouses when they were new to Islam or even before Islam. So then when they, you know, full force decided to practice Islam and they want to wear niqab, it would just cause, you know, like, uh, it was just difficult for their husbands to accept. Do you know what I mean? SubhanAllah. Yeah. And so I knew a lot of sisters who were so, they were so, um, they, they really wanted to wear niqab. And uh, they just weren't able to. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, he knows what's in our hearts. And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a plan for everyone, you know? And I feel like it's really, really, really important to just trust in Allah and to rely upon Allah and to really ask Allah for what we want. You know what I mean? I remember when I was, when I was trying to wear a and I was having a hard time and I was just staying at home. <laughs> I, I, I used to, I, I would have these like daily conversations with Allah and I would just tell him like, this is what I want and you know what I want and you know my reasonings for what I want. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he listens. He listens to the, to, the, to the person who reaches out to him. And Allah, you know, he makes a way. And his, his plan is kind of it's Allah, you know. <laughs> his, his plan is, you know. And it's just a matter of, of, of having patience and having to walk well and, like, really trusting upon him. And, and Allah knows our situation, you know. This is the situation that's best for us. So we just have to figure out how to be patient and how to turn to him and how to, you know, be the best version of ourselves that we can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, sister, what does the niqab mean to you? Oh, um, I don't, the question made me smile. I have the biggest smile and I don't have the word. It's the longest pause you've had in the whole entry. Yeah, just, you know, when you have like that, like deep sigh of like contentment, that's yeah. when you, when you asked me that, I just smiled and I was like, oh, like, it's just, it's just a comfort for me. Mm. It, it's my identity. It's, it's who I am. It's my protection. It's it's almost like my friend that's got my back for me. Yeah, and like, whenever I would like find myself in like a, a, like if I find myself in situations, it's like my niqab is there to prevent me from doing things that I might have done had I not worn them. Yeah, subhanAllah. Definitely. Like, that. It filters the jobs for me. It filters out everything for me. Alhamdulillah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I did not mean to interrupt you. 
I'm, no, no, really, I'm just saying I can identify with what you're saying. Mm. Really. Yeah. yeah. I'm the one who's talking so much. I'd love to hear from you too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, inshallah um yeah uh, inshallah i need to get around to sharing my story as well on the mm -hmm. interviews because i haven't actually done it yet um so yeah stay tuned You're for that. To hear your story <laughs> inshallah <laughs> inshallah yes yeah, subhanallah so finally sister what advice would you give to other sisters who would like to wear the niqab and are contemplating it at the moment i think that whenever we do anything in this life we have to ask ourselves why we're doing what we want to do right so we have to ask ourselves like is this thing that i want to do am i doing it for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala am i doing it to please allah is this something that's going to bring me closer to allah is this something that's going to make a difference in my akhira and in my dunya you know and i think that if we really 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 are extremely mindful and intentional about the decisions that we make then we have the confidence to follow through with them you know because there could be a lot of reasons for you know doing the things that we want to do but when we really um, solidify our intentions and we really decide, hey, I'm doing this for this reason, and when that reason is for the sake of Allah, then it's like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just like opens all the doors for you and everything becomes so easy, you know? And so I think that if a sister wants to wear the niqab and she's debating it, I really think that she should sit down and ask herself, like, truly, why do I want to wear the niqab? And if it turns out to be that she wants to wear it to please Allah because she wants to get closer to Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open all the doors for her. Mm -hmm. And that will happen according to, you know, the time that it's meant to happen, according to the situations that it's meant to happen, and everything like that. And we have to have patience in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. But, wallahi, like, alhamdulillah, like, Allah, he's the best. us, <laughs> You know, and it's just a matter of making sure that the things that we're doing, we're doing them for his sake. And if we're truly doing them for his sake, then Allah makes everything easy, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Jazakallah khair, sister. It's been a real pleasure listening to you, mashallah. I really enjoyed your story and all the things you have to share. And subhanAllah, I feel like there's probably so many more things that you could even tell us. Mashallah. And really, your camp sounds amazing. So, like, yeah, inshallah, one day, hopefully, I'll get to come and go swimming in a lake. <laughs> <laughs> inshallah. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. That's great, mashallah. Jazakallah khair, sister. Thank you so much for giving us your time and sharing with us. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the interview today. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah wa iyaakum. Jazakallah khairan for having me. Uh, may Allah accept all of your attempts and this beautiful project that you're doing with the with the whole podcast and everything like that. May Allah accept it from you and increase you in reward. Ameen. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.